and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 206. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike, and listeners and subscribers. What a treat and a treasure trove we have in store for us today on show 206, Mike. Yes, I feel that time and the powers of the universe bring us to our destiny here today, Mark. (laughs) Oh, I like that. Well, off the back of some excellent shows and books that we did into the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Ryan Holiday, it is only right. In fact, it might even be our destiny, Mike, to cover his latest book, Discipline is Destiny. Now, Mike, this is Ryan Holiday's second book in his Stoic uh, Virtue series, with Courage's Calling being the first. And in this book, I think he's basically written some of the mantras and some of the big lessons from the Moonshot show, hasn't he? I think he's been eavesdropping, Mark. I think he has uh, tuned into the Moonshots uh, podcast and it has said discipline seems to be a theme that comes up so much amongst the superstars, the authors, the great thinkers, the disruptors. They all seem to have this discipline thing. So he has gone back once again to the Stoics. Once again, he has taken ancient thinking and given it a modern uh, retrofit and it is tasty, tasty feasting. It is a really great book. And my, I am just both delighted and excited to share this uh, with you, with our listeners, because I honestly think this is one of the highest order values you need to get stuff done in life. Mm. And it's so good that one of our favorite authors does a book on it. Oh, Mark, I have to calm down. <laughs> well, this is it. This idea of mastering yourself first in order to then go out and maybe master um, management of a team, uh, being the best version of yourself. Maybe it's running a marathon, whatever it might be. It all starts by mastering your own you know, emotions and, and thoughts and then putting that into action, isn't it? Creating the discipline to put into, uh, let's say, a prioritization uh, metric or just sticking to your goals, as mm. we recently found in our goal, Achieving Your Goals series, or even something more small than that, just waking up in the morning. There's so much that stems from this uh, morsel of discipline and, and self-control that we we run into so much on the Moonshot Show. And like you say, uh, I'm, I'm sharing a similar level of enthusiasm, Mike. It's so amazing that Ron Holiday has been able to retroactively look at the Stoics and ancient philosophy and ancient thinking and bring it into a modern time. And there's just still so much for us to learn, even though we've already done all of his previous books. It's amazing to then see yet another build that we can we can go out and learn from. Well, hopefully in this show, what we can do, Mark, is we can squeeze out a number of big thoughts, big ideas around discipline, um, really kind of give it a frame and some context, but also we are going to pepper each other with, and our listeners too, with so many practical tips on how to make discipline a daily practice. So if you enjoyed the build up to this show with all our Ryan holiday series, get ready. If you're newer to the show or you're just tuning into this show for the first time, we are going to break it all down. We're going to learn out loud so we can be the best version of ourselves. And discipline, Mark, I promise you, is something you need to understand as a priority, as a philosophy, as a principle, but equally still as a daily practice, as a habit. And we're going to get that done in this show. So Mark, where do you want to start? Well, with a promise as interesting and valuable as that, Mike, I think it's only right for us to hear from the author, the philosopher himself, Mr. Ron Holiday, introduce the book to Good Morning America and tell us why he's so interested in the idea of discipline. Now you're deep diving into discipline or self-control. It dates back thousands of years, but you think now is the best time to write about it. Why? We live in a world that our ancestors would be so jealous of. We have unlimited options. We have abundance. We have freedoms that they couldn't conceive of. But the flip side of that is that it's an opportunity, or you could say an obligation, for self-control, for self-discipline. The Stoics have this great line. They say, the most powerful person is the person who's under their own power. So are you being controlled by the devices, by the temptations, by all the things you can do? 
or are you in control? And I think the decision about what you do and don't do, this, the, the limits you set or don't set, this determines who you are and what you're going to be able to do in life. I think we all apply self-control in different ways, whether it's eating, exercise, social media, what, whatever it is in your life. But you say think about this in three main parts. So walk us through the physical, emotional, and spiritual act of it. Well, the, the physical is going to be the most basic, right? how much you sleep, how you dress, what you eat when you wake up, the, the sort of basic habits we, we would go into being a person. But I think I'm most interested in what we might call the temperamental side of self-discipline. I, I gave a talk to the Los Angeles Rams a couple years ago, and they have this great motto. It's keep the main thing the main thing. They say, actually, uh -huh. the main thing is to keep the main thing the main uh -huh. thing. Yeah. But that in, in a world of temptation and distraction and lots of opportunities, lots of things wanting your time, that takes self-discipline, right? To be in control of your emotions, to go, this is my main task, this is the main thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna focus on that. And then I think the highest level of self-discipline, you think about the great Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius, becomes the emperor of Rome, he's the most powerful man in the world. Now he can do anything, no one can stop him. Actually, he needs self-discipline more than anything. And I think he has this great line to himself, he says, strict with yourself, tolerant with others. Whoa. That's the other part. It's not just, wow. I like that. It's not yeah. just, hey, I'm hard. It's called self-discipline for a reason. It, you can only apply it to yourself. You have to be understanding and empathetic of other people. Mm. So I'm going to go off script a little bit because I'm wondering, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges for people when it comes to self-control and discipline? And what's one of the best secrets for getting over those? Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my rules is when I wake up in the morning, I don't touch my phone for the first 30 minutes to one hour that I'm awake. Oh, oh so my that's self-control right there. <laughs> and, and I don't sleep with the phone in the room, right? It's like, who, who controls? How do you wake up? Uh, the alarm is in the other room. So I got to get up and I got to go do it. And my right. thing is, I don't want to get sucked into that from the second that I wake up. I don't want to be reactive. I want to think, what do I have to do today? What's the headspace that I want to be in? What's the main thing? And I want to tackle that first. I try to, my other rule is like, do the hard thing first. Mm. So what's the big task for the day? Is it writing? Is it a, you know, I don't want to you schedule this morning meeting and this and that. And then you're, it's 3 p.m. and you're like, what was I supposed to do today? And you've, you've lost it. So you do the hard thing first to focus on the hard thing first. Yes. Right. All right. One quick thing that we can do right now. Yes. If people are watching, want to get some self-discipline. What can we do? When we think about, okay, you don't want to use my phone right in the morning. If you wake up at 10 o'clock, you got to use your phone. But if you wake up at six o'clock or five o'clock, if you have early, the morning's there for you. And you think about someone like Toni Morrison. She's this editor at Random House. She has two young kids. She's a single mom. And she goes, okay, if I want to be a writer, I got to get up early and do that first. She said, I want to make contact with the muses before I hear the word mom in the morning. Oh my gosh. And, and that, that's what it takes. You got, what does it take? Yeah. And how, how can I set up my life or systems so I'm not white knuckling it, but I, I know, hey, I got up early. I tackled the hard thing. Now, anything else that happens today, that's extra. Mark, like it just starts with getting the phone out of the room. That's mm -hmm. one thing that we could all do today in the journey towards discipline. And this part, part of this bigger idea that who's running the show here yeah. is your iPhone running the show or are you mm -hmm. now I relate to this a lot and, um, I cannot tell you what it has done for me personally, Mike, to get the iPhone out of my bedroom. Yes. I wear an Apple watch, but it, it is put on sleep or do not disturb mode. The only thing, if I have to use the alarm to get up, because actually if I get to bed early, I will wake up naturally at a really good time. But let's say the alarm does go off. Deferring the time to iPhone, <laughs> what a great metric, time to iPhone, um, is so important because imagine if you can just have your thoughts in the morning get clear on your intentions for the day. So you don't, as Ryan Holiday mentioned, get to like 3, 3 p.m. and go, hang on, what did I want to achieve today, right? It's pretty much gone by 3 p.m. Um, I think this is the battle that we're all in. Like who is taking our attention, time, and energy, the world around us or ourselves? And this little habit of putting the iPhone in another room and not sleeping with your phone next to you, it is huge on intentionality. Like even if you fail at, at the self-control and self-discipline, it is a gesture. It is a start of the process. Okay. Number one, but number two, 
you are ensuring the likelihood of success is that much higher because you won't be giving in to temptation. You know, Yoko Willink talks about the snooze alarm being the greatest enemy of success, mm. right? I, I think there is so much in just that little gesture of just don't put the phone in the room. That for me tells all levels of this story of why destiny is in discipline, why it matters so much because there are just so many notifications. Mark, how hard is it to try and look at your phone and not look at a notification or a message? Like it's almost, it's really impossible, isn't it? You know, something's going to get you. Yeah. And I think this really speaks to the idea that the world is, you know, out of our control, isn't it? Everything that we read in the news, um, social media, these are things that don't necessarily impact us directly unless we want them to. So by picking up your phone in the morning and let's say reading the news, checking social media, maybe even looking at your emails while you're in bed, suddenly your mind is taken out of that present moment. And I'm really hearing, you know, a lot of this uh, intentionality like Eckhart Tolle would teach us Mm. around staying present, the deliberate Mm. actions to think about where am I right now? What can I see, hear, smell, touch, feel? (laughs) utilizing, you know, something that's, you know, somewhat basic, if you really think about it and leave your phone in another room, you suddenly can be the master of how you wake up. And yes, you might have an alarm or yes, your Apple watch might vibrate. Regardless of any of that, the way that you're waking up is still going to be in your control, isn't it? That's right. And that react, uh, that lack of the reactivity to instant notifications that distract you and maybe even cause you a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of uncertainty with regards to your day, you know, getting up out of bed and feeling already overwhelmed. Mm. Nobody wants to do that, do they? And I think you're right. Something as simple as just leaving your phone in your study, your office, your kitchen, whatever it is, and going to bed without it. Not only is it impacting how you wake up, but it's also impacting how you go to sleep. And I think that's a uh, a key two-hander within all of this conversation around discipline, isn't it? The idea of getting a good rest, being disciplined with how you set yourself up for sleep and then how you come out of the sleep, I think is is intrinsically linked. Yeah. I mean, I think that the perhaps of the highest order is the capacity to not watch mm. another episode. Yeah. You know, that little thing on Netflix, it comes up and it says, Go to the, you you know how you can kind of skip quickly into the next episode and keep going and going like the capacity to say, no, I should go brush my teeth and get to bed. Mm. That is the moment because once you do that, then it's easier to leave the iPhone somewhere else other than the bedroom. Then it's easier to get into bed, maybe read a book, maybe just calm the jets, Mm -hmm. get to sleep at a good time. Then you wake at a better time. You feel better. Uh, consistently over time. It, it's so, so important to understand this idea of discipline and self-control not only helps you have a good day, but if you step back, Mark, what we have most certainly found, whether it's Einstein or Yoko Willink, the theme of discipline is at the heart of their success. If we mm-hmm. talk at Serena Williams, Michael Jordan, discipline. What a treat we have to get into one of the greatest arts of success, discipline. We can do it right in this show. And I tell you who's been really disciplined and that is our members, Mark. They are one early to early to bed, early to rise kind of crew. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're totally right. Our members just keep on growing and not only are they all growing week on week, day by day, but also our very valuable members who've been with us for over a year keeps on growing as well, Mike. So without further ado, introducing, first of all, our annual members, John, Bob, Terry, Ken, Dietmar, and now Marjan. Thank you for staying with us 
for well over a year. But also not to forget our very, very uh, illustrious crew also include Connor, Rodrigo, Yasmin and Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Paul, Bergen, Kalman, David, Joe, Crystal and Ivo, Christian, Hurricane Brain, Samuela, Kelly and Barbara, Andre and Matthew, Eric, Abby, Jose, Joshua, Chris and Deborah, Lasse, Steve, Craig and Lauren, Javier, Daniel, Andrew and Ravi, Yvette, Karen, Raul and PJ, Nicoara, Ola, Ingram and our brand new members, Sarah, Dirk and Emily. Welcome existing as well as brand new members to our Moonshots family. Yeah, well done, Marjan. With us for a year, she has launched herself to the moon. So well done. And also welcome to Emily, Dirk and Sarah. Um, just so great to see people from all four corners of the planet coming together to learn out loud, to be the best version of ourselves together. We're all doing this. We're all kind of uh, figuring things out. And that's definitely what we're doing here at the show. Thank you very much. We're very grateful for your support. We hope you're enjoying the uh, Moonshot Master Series, which only our members get. And if you would like to listen to the Moonshot Master Series, it's a monthly podcast. It is the epic, uh, you know, kind of, masterclass that we put together around some of our key topics. I wonder if we'll do discipline as one for the next one, Mark. What do you think? think? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're right, but I tell you what, I think our members as well as our listeners will just have to navigate over to moonshots.io, click on the member button to find out whether that is indeed going to be the theme of our next master episode. And you might be asking yourself, what exactly do we mean? by this idea of self-control and self-discipline? Well, the good news is we have the author himself, Mr. Ryan Holiday, talking about that very topic. There's a maxim, discipline equals freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you view, because you're a very disciplined guy. Prior to recording, I asked you, I don't know how your output level with a high level of quality and consistency remains so high. And you simply said, it's every day. And that's, yeah. but that's discipline though. Like it's almost like you've taken it for granted the amount of discipline you have, uh, for the output, because it's not only the books, there's tons of articles, there's your emails, sure. there's your podcast. I mean, there's a lot going on. So can you talk about how that discipline is what's led to both your freedom and your output? Well, I think it's important. What we're talking about here is self-discipline, right? You can imagine an environment in which my day looks exactly the same and my output looks exactly the same, but there's like a gun to my head, right? And suddenly it's not the same thing, right? So I'm talking about self-discipline. Of course, discipline is important. Discipline is important on a football team. It's important in the army. It's important in a prison also, right? Discipline is there and it matters, but I'm really talking about self-discipline. And there's uh, that line, discipline uh, equals freedom from from Jocko Willink. It's great. Um, There's a quote from Eisenhower that's similar that that I think illustrates the angle that I'm thinking about it. Uh, Eisenhower said, uh, freedom is the opportunity for self-discipline, right? So the idea is once you, first off, we're, we're, we're lucky to live in a society where we have all sorts of freedom that most of what we, uh, uh, most things that we do are voluntary, right? We have choices to be and act however we want for the most part. That's good. But also success creates a certain kind of freedom. Uh, There's different forms of freedom. But the point is, I'm talking about what happens when you can do whatever you want, but you choose to continue to keep oneself in check or to stay disciplined. Like uh, several books ago, I could have said, eh, you know, uh, I'm 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 going to take it easy from here on out. I'm not saying I don't have to work. I'm just saying the the pace or the system the structure that I've set for myself is not a function of like needing to eat. It's also not a function of some sort of, which is another form of, of slavery. I would say it's not, I'm not trying to prove something to someone, right? Like I'm not also like the reason I'm doing this many books is because I want to sell the most books out of anyone in the world. And that's what, you know, so I'm talking about how do you get to a place where you're doing these things voluntarily because it's who you want to be and it's what you want to do. Mike, I think this is a great clip from Ron Holiday because he's he's kind of confronting us here, isn't he? As he explains the idea of what he means 
and perhaps what the Stoics meant by self-discipline. And the thing that really stands out to me is, well, first of all, this difference that he calls out at the beginning of the clip, you can get an output from me with a gun to my head. I can give you what you want, but it is not going to be the same, perhaps quality, the same output as one that I myself would do. And I think that's quite a key differentiator, isn't it? You need to be the master and commander of your own output in order to deliver the work that you're really, really proud of and that you believe is is valuable. I think straight away that definition and that terminology and that breakdown of self-discipline versus being commanded to do something then introduces this idea around freedom, don't you think? I think where we are going here is the choice to self-impose discipline Mm -hmm. is the greatest form of empowerment because when you self-impose standards, high standards upon yourself and you choose to reach those when you don't have to, there is a calling upon your will your ambition, it is the true manifestation. It's the true path to being the best version of ourselves Mm. because you chose the path. So, you know, the way I reflect on this is I was incredibly lazy up until my uh, 20th, uh, until I was about 20, and um, I had an aha moment I got a job that I really shouldn't have got. I was underqualified, but I fortune uh, came my way. And I realized that if I didn't turn things around and start getting disciplined, um, that, you know, I wasn't going to be much in life. So here's the interesting thing. I had, I was at 20 years of age. I was living, um, in the city. I had moved out of home from my parents. So I moved back in with my parents and I started working every single day on being disciplined, giving my best and nobody forced me to do it. Mm. Like it was my choice. It was a, an awakening. I was like, Oh my gosh, I need to get after it. So after a lifetime of missed opportunity and laziness, I said, holy smoke, get ready. I'm getting after it. And that is one of the, one of the most important things to ever happen in my life because I made that decision. I went to a really strict high performance grammar school where you wore a suit and tie every day, but that was their rules on me. It wasn't until I applied my rules and expectations on myself that I truly opened up a whole new level of performance and it made such a difference. It's shocking. Once I was uh, ready to make that decision, I remember being 20 years of age and leaving the office at 11 o'clock at night and just to be in time for the last train home. And then I get in the office at eight o'clock in the morning. And I did this for a huge amount of time. Like I had never, ever sustained that level of discipline in the 20 years previously, but I made that choice. And to me, always coming back to that, there's always a time to renew that kind of choice or to make it, uh, to apply yourself to something, uh, that is your choice, your rules, and your expectations. Because in the end of the day, Mark, if you say to yourself, I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. every single morning because I want to, it'll be so much harder than as Ryan Holiday said, if someone's got a gun to your head, yeah, sure, you're going to get out of bed at 6, but you didn't make that choice. And what comes from making that choice, that self-determination, is you get belief, you get momentum, you get all of these incredibly positive energies that you can use not just to get out of bed at 6 a.m., but you'll find that it kind of permeates into all parts of your life, professional and personal. When you choose to apply the self-discipline, when you achieve the rules that you set, the other thing for me, Mark, is when you do 
achieve something that was a result of you setting the rules to be self-disciplined. Nobody else set the goal but you and you got it done. The well-being, the fulfillment, the satisfaction you get from achieving goals you set for yourself because you chose to, this is what we're talking about. This is what comes from self-discipline. This is why it's of the highest order. Uh, This is why I implore everyone, myself, you, and all of our listeners and members, Mark, set your goals, set your discipline, keep to it because you choose it because it's part of who you want to become. It's the vision you have of yourself. This to me, Mark, is what is deeply inside this book. Discipline is destiny. Mm. Mm. I think that's so well said. I think the only thing that I can really, you know, offer to build on Mike is when you're exploring this idea of, um, control, intentionality, leading towards you know, setting your goals to go out and achieve the things that you want to, you want to do. You're reminding me of Michael D. Watkins's the first 90 days. And this is fundamentally what he was saying before you want to and can go out and set your own goals. You need to create intention Mm. that all those goals, your KPIs, your strategies, whatever they are, unless you have the intention to stick to it, which only you can really motivate yourself towards you're never going to necessarily achieve them to the best of your ability, are you? And again, it's similar to what Ron Holiday was saying about the gun to your head. Yeah, I can deliver what you're asking for, but unless I'm the one who's personally making that choice, you know, to get out of bed, to go for that extra long run in lead up to, let's say a marathon or have that uh, ability to listen to others and understand what they are saying versus, you know, um, pushing forward my point of view, you know, this is what we're hearing from Ron Holiday mm-hmm. in that first clip, being strict with yourself, tolerant with others. Unless you've got that as a practice and an intention, then what's perhaps likely is we'll all steer back to, uh, in your case, Mike, that first 20 years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, the funny thing is if you know that, that call it laziness is inside of you, um, you have to hold yourself accountable and mm. say, you know, never again. I'm not, I'm just not going there. And it's also, you know, part of this is not just about yourself. It's also mm. about the people around you, the team around you and, you know, the opinions of others. And whilst you should be tolerant and, you know, non-judgmental, I think the critical thing that we're talking about here is the transition on your goals, your purpose, your mission, your the vision that you have of who you want to be and hold yourself to that. Don't worry about what others expect you to do. Hold yourself to a higher standard. And we, in fact, we have a great clip now where Ryan Holiday is talking to Tamron Hall about this very subject. Seneca, one of the, the ancient Stoics, he said, the most powerful person is the person who is under their own power. Yeah. Right? And so if you yeah. see it as this opportunity to be like, I decide what I do and don't do. Yeah. That makes you great. Okay, for a lot of people, though, they think discipline. That sounds rigid. It sounds so fun. It sounds like, you know, you're not going to be able to relax and have a drink or whatever you do to unwind. But you say discipline is not a punishment. It's a way to avoid punishment. We do it because we love ourselves. We value ourselves and what we do. And we find conveniently enough that it also heightens our enjoyment of things as well. Well, one of the ways that they would talk about self-discipline is the word temperance. Mm -hmm. Temperance doesn't mean nothing. It means the right amount of something, Mm. right? So uh, no pleasure is not a particularly good way to (laughs) No, it is not. But if it's so much pleasure you have the hangover after or you regret it the next day or a month later you look in the mirror and you're like, what happened? You know, how pleasurable was that actually? Right. You also write in the book, no one can say yes to their destiny without saying no to what is clearly someone else's. What does that mean? I was reading that over and over. I'm like, speak to me, great philosopher. No (laughs) one can say yes to their destiny without saying no to what is clearly someone else's. I think we've all experienced this as you become successful in what you do. You start getting all these other cool opportunities, uh, other other things, people asking you for some of your time, people asking if you want to do this, if you want to do that. And what you have to realize is that you can't say yes to everything. And in fact, when you say yes to one thing, You're saying no to something else. Mm. And conversely, this is really important, when you say no to something, 
you're also saying yes to something. So when Marx really says that we, when we ask ourselves, hey, is this thing essential? Is this really what I have to be doing? Right. We find out a lot of the things that get thrown at us or people try to guilt us into doing or everyone else is doing, we find out, hey, it's not essential. And when we eliminate that stuff, it's good in and of itself. Because I, when I thought about that, I thought about how many times we feel like we're being pulled in a bunch of different directions. I mean, we all know that feeling of everyone wants something from me at this point. And not monetary, your time, your energy. Prince used to call people energy vampires. Yes. You get on the phone with them, you literally feel weak because they are pulling from you. Yes. And so, so when you say no to things, you're saying yes to the important things. Right. There's a, a great line I heard about um, the Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one, one of her clerks said what I so admired her about her, and I think this is a thing that women struggle with especially, um, what I loved about her is when she said no, she never said sorry first. She just said, no, I can't do it. Yeah. 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 And, and that takes self-discipline if you're a people pleaser. Yeah. If you are afraid to hurt other people's feelings. If you, like me, I want to do everything. And it feels, it's almost painful to say no. You got that fear of missing out. But the things you're saying yes to, it means you're saying no to other things. Oftentimes, to your family. And so I have to realize when I'm saying yes to some random thing that came into my inbox... I'm saying no to my little kids, and I already promised time to them. And so you have to have discipline about what you say yes to and what you say no to. Mike, I mean, again, this is right on the money when it comes to some of the themes, the topics, and the lessons that we've learned from the Moonshot Show. I mean, I'm already being reminded of Kim Scott's Radical Candle, Mm -hmm. which obviously, you know, as isolated as a book is more around how you interact with others and uh, teamwork and you know, managing people. But I think it kind of applies quite nicely here because what it's uh, illustrating is that once you learn the value of saying no, then you suddenly free yourself up to do the things that matter to you. And as we're learning from Ron Holiday, this intentionality and this decision to, to set the uh, direction that you're going to go out and and follow and stay focused on the things that you want to go out and do is your key towards freedom, destiny. So actually I, I can see this build that Ron Holiday is doing here, which is if you are strict and you utilize discipline in a proactive way, it doesn't have to be punishment. It doesn't have to be limiting. If anything, it's actually your key to being much more open and free with your time to go out and do the work that really, really matters and that you want to get out of bed in the morning to go out and do. So here's an interesting practical example of focusing on yourself rather than what others want. I think it it would be to plan your day and set your priorities before you look at your inbox. Mm. Yep. Because in the inbox is everybody else's priorities, right? Exactly. Yep. And and this is... I, I think we've spoken about this before, Mike. This is certainly something that I have to do every day. Mm. I, I try and at the end of a day, so for example, at the end of today, I'll I'll do a, a kind of mental checklist and make sure, okay, this is what I've done, you know, moonshots, tick, I've done that meeting and so on. And maybe I'll make a plan for what my next day tomorrow looks like. Mm. I'll then revisit that in the morning. So tomorrow morning when I wake up, my phone will be in the other room. Uh, I promise. (laughs) I promise, Ryan. (laughs) And I'll be able to look at it without checking um, anything else. It's the things that I've been maybe reflecting on while I sleep. Okay, what are the priorities I need to do today? Then you can open up your messages, your Slack, your emails, the million and one notifications that you've probably received. Mm. You're no longer being dictated or controlled by those, are you? Because you're now free to prioritize based on the things that really matter to you, to your job, to your team. Yeah. And we're not talking about being antisocial here. What we're talking about is knowing the mission that you're on and make sure you don't get taken off course. So I think another example, really practical that you can do for, for being disciplined it goes back to something I've mentioned on a show recently. You know, I got invited to to be a guest on a podcast and, um, you know, I just asked the question, oh, it's, it's a bit odd that you'd invite me. It's very nice, but tell me a bit more about how you think I could contribute because, you know, I'm not really into the topic area that you guys covered and they never even answered the email. <laughs> <laughs> so it took one little bit of pushback done in a very gentle way. Um, where I'm just like, oh, 
Oh, yeah. well, well, what would we talk about? You know, <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm not really into this very, very specific tech thing. And um, I think it's just like if someone invites you to an event um, and you're like, hmm, you, do you have every right to, oh, thank you. Could you, could you tell me a little bit more about it? Right. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. And as they reveal this invitation to you, you can be like, oh, listen, um, the following day I have a big commitment. You know, there's a lot of legitimate things in your life that would prevent you from participating that if you do it correctly, it doesn't have to be, you know, crushing for the other people. And I think a lot of the time we say yes because we don't want to hurt their feelings, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Or we don't want to appear unapproachable or, or whatever. But I think if you can learn to say, tell me more about this obligation or this invitation or this request. And, you know, another thing that comes to my mind is um, when people request something of you, you can say, yes, I can do that, but not this week. Yeah. <laughs> Because often we're under this huge stress. We're like, oh, I'm not another thing. I'm already jam-packed this week, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's. I mean, how many times when you say, listen, I am really busy this week, but I can certainly take care of it next week. In the meantime, I could send you this thing if that helps. How many times do people turn around Well, and say, well, that's dreadfully unagreeable and, yeah. and impractical. You, I hate you. You're terrible. You're so infl-. Like, no. Often it leads to some sort of negotiation of expectations and you can resolve it pretty quickly. Mm. I, I think a lot of the time we mindlessly get committed to stuff without really realizing or sensing some discomfort but not really addressing it and then we get all tied because we're like, oh, my gosh, I got like a 60-hour week. I'm fully obligated. I'm not happy, right? Yeah. You get grumpy and you take it out on the ones that you love. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and look, I, I've been guilty of, of this, this, uh, this idea of taking on, you know, too much work. And to be honest, Mike, I think it's down to ego. You know, I think it's down to wanting to take on all of the work because then suddenly dun, 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 the hero's here, he's doing it all. But the, the problem is, and I've learned this through, through experience, if you take on too much and you say yes to everything, suddenly the quality drastically goes down because you're no longer focused on doing the job at hand. You can't give anything your full focus because you're being pulled over by a team over here this isn't your day job. This isn't your business as usual. You're doing it extra. Now that's impacting your normal day job and the roles and responsibilities that you have, whether it's to your loved ones or to work. And suddenly you get into a kind of quagmire of seeing so much going on and it's paralyzing, isn't it? You just don't know where to focus your time. And obviously we explored that in the, in the goal series, but I can see how this discipline would remove this uncertainty and this, um, unsteady ground and this lack of prioritization, because if you start with what matters to you and to those around you and, and what you need to go out and do to be maybe the best version of yourself or do the work that's required of you, let's say it's waking up in the morning to go out and do that hard work, the big job at hand, do it first thing because you're going to be clear of all other responsibilities. That for me is is just such a great little tip, isn't it? To try and see how we can take back control of our lives, but also learn how to say no to a lot of the other requirements or requests that come over our table every day. Yeah. It it it's really, you know, funnily enough, it's exactly the same as a great product. Steve Jobs said the hardest thing about the first iPhone was what not to put into uh, it. Yes. You know. That's right. And I think this question of you are your choices really kind of sits adjacent to this idea of discipline. And if you can focus on finding the tools, doing the jobs that you need to be the best version of yourself, then you'll unlock a whole lot of value and just trade things off a little bit, discuss things and challenge your inbox, right? Don't just mindlessly accept what's coming to you. I think something that you can totally embrace and accept in your inbox is a whole lot of loving from the Moonshots podcast. You can go to moonshots.io, Mark. You can sign up for a newsletter. You can get notification of all the new shows. You can go to moonshots.io. You can get show notes. But if that's a bridge too far, 
Mike, you could open this very app that you're listening to this show on right now, couldn't you? Yeah. I mean, if, if navigating to moonshots.io to find newsletters, episode lists, um, member signups is just that little bit too much, pop into your Spotify app or Apple podcast, whatever means that you're using to listen to the Moonshot Show today with Ryan Holiday, Discipline is Destiny, and leave us a rating or review. It very much influences and impacts how the show is spread around the world. And it really has introduced just this simple mechanic of you, our listeners, leaving ratings and reviews, getting the show out into the ears as well as the hands of listeners from around the world. And we really are, Mike, reaching the four corners, which is fantastic. And it's great to see the listeners growing each month. But it really starts with you, our day-to-day, week-to-week listeners. Leaving a rating or review makes a huge difference, doesn't it, Mike? Yeah, it is a great habit uh, that you could get yourself into a good morning routine of clicking like or giving us five stars, whatever it takes to spread the love to share. I mean, we're all learning out loud here. We don't know what, no one person's got the answers, but I tell you what, one person who's got quite a few is Ryan Holiday. So let's have a, a little taster of, well, if he wrote about discipline, what does his morning routine look like? What does your normal work day look like? Are you doing like a nine to five? Uh, not nine to five. Like I wake up early, I go for a run or a walk with the kids, whether we're at my farm or my place in, in town. I don't check my phone in the morning. I don't eat in the morning. I usually journal in the morning and then I go, I write usually for two or three hours. And then the rest of the day after that is business, other work stuff. I'm done by four almost every day. So I'm probably work eight, 30 to four. Like this is a short and sharp clip that I think really bridges us from uh, this understanding that we now have around self-discipline and how to put it into practicality. The key thing for me that I'm hearing from Ryan Holiday there is actually his admission. He does not necessarily follow that strict routine of nine to five, which a lot of us have, you know, sort of grown up around. Instead, what Ryan Holiday does is he chooses the moments in his day when he's A, uh, perhaps most free physically because he's not in calls and so on. So he spends time with his family, but also B, he prioritizes the things that he needs to get done, such as journaling, such as doing the hardest bit in the morning Mm -hmm. so that he knows he's accomplished that item, that thing, and then can get on with the rest of his day, his business as usual, or his work, his writing books after that. And I, I think what's really important here is how that pattern that he's chosen, that he's created for himself, through perhaps experimentation, he's now got the discipline to maintain day to day. And I think that's a really important call out for us. I would agree. And, and, and just a side note here, a lot of highly productive people really have a similar routine to him. Get up pretty early. We've got Robin Sharma, 5am club, check out moonshots.io if you want to listen to that episode, but also particularly, um, a nuance that I see a lot is people not having a large breakfast in the Mm. morning. Now, for those of you who are big athletes, um, and I know if I run, uh, do a big run very early in the morning, I don't tend to uh, like to run like at six or seven. I'm more like a 10 kind of 10 o'clock kind of guy. I know after a big run, you know, you just have to eat for some people they need to eat before, but my, the amount of people that you hear who do not eat anything until 11 or 12 at, uh, in the morning, um, because they feel that they think so mm. clearly when they haven't been eating breakfast, it's quite a large number of people, right? I, I would say in my experience, it seems to be growing for sure. I, I certainly have experimented, you know, for most of my career, probably from, in fact, I was thinking about it earlier, probably for maybe 20 or 25 years, I, I was quite religious almost about breakfasts and had it every day. It was very regimented. Um, in fact, I was probably very disciplined about doing it. <laughs> so the idea of skipping it Uh, was quite foreign to me, quite alien. Why would I do that? I'm not going to be the best version of myself. But actually, by skipping that breakfast and keeping myself, um, you know, in theory, running on empty, I was actually lighter. I felt physically 
um, more agile and my brain was able to function, maybe not um, infinitely quicker, but certainly I could see a, a little bit of a difference. Now, I think the call out here is it's probably up to the individual. Like you say, Mike, if you're in training or otherwise, you know, you're probably going to have a diet regime figured out, mm. but you're right. You know, even when you and I have collaborated, the times when I've skipped breakfast, I, I find that actually I'm pretty efficient. I'll be starving by lunchtime, <laughs> but it, it does seem to work, doesn't it? Yeah. Look, a halfway point is if, if I go uh, vegetarian is another way of feeling lighter. So I really try and avoid um, meat and carbs. Um, that's another way of achieving a similar sort of level. Mm. Um, if you want to kind of be in that very lean food consumption, you want to devote most of your brain power uh, to thinking and not your body re-diverting all its energy to digestion. Mm -hmm. Really interesting uh, idea. What's also interesting is it's not only Ryan Holiday who is studying the Stoics. In fact, we've actually done a great job here and we found a clip from a guy called Thomas Frank who's got a channel called College Info Geek and he's actually come up with a couple of handy tips, a couple of uh, bits of advice that he's peeled away also from the Stoics, from a Roman emperor, and it's all about achieving self-discipline. So to add a bit of spice to this Ryan Holiday special on Discipline is Destiny, let's have a listen now to some more advice from ancient Roman emperors. I've been getting a lot of questions about how to build self-discipline, the ability to force yourself to do the things that are congruent with your goals and aspirations, but not exactly with your desires in the moment. Now, while there's a lot that can be said on this subject, and I have a lot of experiences of my own that I'd like to share with you in a future video, today I want to share just one simple thought that comes from the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Aurelius ruled Rome from 161 to 180 AD, and he's considered to be the last of the five good emperors, but he's also considered to be one of the most important Stoic philosophers philosophers. And his book Meditations, which is considered to be one of the most important texts in Stoic philosophy, contains a passage that has a lot to say about self-discipline. And I think it might even be the foundation of self-discipline. So in book five of Meditations, Aurelius writes, at dawn, when you have trouble getting out of bed, tell yourself, I have to go to work as a human being. What do I have to complain of if I'm going to do what I was born for, the things I was brought into the world to do? Or is this what I was created for? To huddle under the blankets and stay warm? But it's nicer here. So you were born to feel nice instead of doing things and experiencing them? Don't you see the plants, the birds, the ants and spiders and bees going about their individual tasks, putting the world in order as best they can? And you're not willing to do your job as a human being? Why aren't you running to do what your nature demands? But we have to sleep sometime. Agreed. But nature set a limit on that, as it did on eating and drinking. And you're over that limit. You've had more than enough of that, but not of working. There, you're still below your quota. You don't love yourself enough, or you'd love your nature too and what it demands of you. People who love what they do wear themselves down doing it. They even forget to wash or eat. Do you have less respect for your own nature than the engraver does for engraving, the dancer for dance, the miser for money, or the social climber for status? When they're really possessed by what they do, they'd rather stop eating and sleeping than give up practicing their arts. He's telling you to respect your choice of path in life enough that you consider it to be your very nature, to be instinct. Just as spiders and bees and ants get up every day and are driven by their instincts, so should you be driven by the actions that are demanded by your goals. If yesterday you decided you wanted to get up early so you could work on your goals, but now you're lying in bed and you feel all comfortable and you don't want to get up, then you need to focus your mind on your nature, on the path you've chosen, and let that override your current desire. Other aspects of the art of gaining self-discipline, like exercises for building grit or systems that commit you to things ahead of time, are important, but they take a back step to this one key insight. For Marcus Aurelius, respecting your work as your very nature and tailoring your decisions and actions in accordance with that was the most important part of building discipline. So my parting thought for this short video is to figure out why you're doing what you're doing. What's the reason for it? And once you figure that out, consider that work to be your very nature as a person and tailor your actions towards that. Hopefully this video has helped you in some way, and if you want to read Meditations, you can pick up a paper copy like I've got, or you can read it entirely free online since the dude wrote the book like 2,000 years ago. Mike, we're hearing a great clip there from College Info Geek bringing to life the work of Marcus Aurelius and his book, or the fifth book of Meditations. The thing that's really standing out to me, and again, 
not that we're trying to encourage all of our listeners to just get out of bed, <laughs> is mm. again this re- this uh, uh, reference to the idea of huddling under the blankets, staying warm, being comfortable uh, to an excessive level. Mm. And instead being strict with yourself, being disciplined with yourself and questioning, was this why I'm here? Is this what I've been brought into the world to do, mm. to stay in bed? That for me is is such a wonderful uh, insight, I think, and, and a wonderful lesson to to ask myself when I do have moments like that, which to be honest is, is somewhat frequent. But when I do get out of bed, well, no matter what time it is, presume, uh, preferably early because Sydney is uh, waking up very early nowadays, it's when I can go out and maybe exercise, when I can walk the dog, when I can get that fresh air. And, as, and I never regret it. I never once have regretted getting up early no. because then you do feel good about yourself. I mean, how do you relate to that, that quote from Aurelius there? Well, I think, you know, it, it's so funny how we, you know, I mentioned that quote from Yoko Willing, like the snooze button is like the enemy <laughs> of, of finding your, your destiny or becoming the best version of yourself. It's so true. I think it's about reminding yourself. Um, I think what, what is really important is one of the techniques I use to wake myself up, to get out of the fog is to think about my legacy. Mm. And how do you want to be remembered? What, when you're gone from this planet, what's the residual net effect, positive impact that you have had? And once you start thinking about that, I don't know, just start doing it, Mark. Like, Mm -hmm. hey, when Mark is no longer with us, what is going to be left on this planet? It has a, it's a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? (laughs) It's it's a confronting (laughs) idea, isn't it? It's a confronting idea. And, you know, perhaps if that is too confronting for some of our listeners, then I suppose a uh, more short-term idea, Mike, could be what is the effect that getting up early is going to have on you? You know, if you go out and do a walk, get out in the sure. sun, do that tough thing in the morning. Or, I mean, think how beneficial it'll be for that rest of the day or the week just to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, ask yourself, let's say you're about to to change jobs or you're considering your job. How would your colleagues talk at your farewell party Yeah, about you? Yeah. Or how will you feel at the end of the week if you didn't? do that important thing. Yep. I think transporting yourself to the future state to understand your choices today by thinking about tomorrow is a really powerful technique of saying when you, you know, when you're in bed and the alarm goes off and it's all warm and toasty and you're considering skipping getting out for this morning, what does it matter? It's Thursday, you know, it's almost Mm -hmm. end of the week, right? Ask yourself, about how you're going to feel about that in the future and how many times are you going to do that before you call yourself out? And that, that's not easy. And I think, I think it's really important that we all acknowledge that we all struggle with this. It's just part of life, but do you want to feel nice now or fulfilled at the end of the week? Which do you choose? Which do you choose? Do you want to be sitting there having finished your dinner at night, knowing you put in a great effort, you did work that matters, you helped others, and you're like, "Ah, that feels good. That was a good day. Do Mm. you want that or do you want to like, well, I kind of skipped this whole thing I should have done. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Do you want? I think that is is the, the kind of eternal question is like how do you maintain how do you keep self-discipline? And Mark, who have we got that's got some thoughts on that? Well, listeners and members and Moonshots family, I mean, we've really heard the case from Ryan Holiday today, introduce us and direct us towards the value and the importance of self-discipline. Now, if we, you're thinking, oh, that all sounds a little bit like tough work, well, don't worry. We've got one more clip from Mr. Ryan Holiday, the author of Destiny uh, of di- dis- discipline is destiny. Who's going to close out our show and tell us how discipline leads to joy? 
For some people, they, they lack discipline. This is why they can't get up off the couch. This is why they shove food in their mouth that they shouldn't do. This is why they don't do the hard work on themselves or whatever's in front of them. But then there's other people who have the exact opposite problem. They're too driven. They can't relax. They can't let up, which is why at the Oracle of Delphi, their famous piece of advice was moderation in all things. It's not good to have no discipline, to have no motivation and no drive. But conversely, it's not any better to have too much of these things. In the end, you wreck yourself. Ozymandias, look at my works and despair, right? You hurt other people and you don't fully realize the gifts that you have. So when we say that discipline is destiny, it's not any amount of discipline, it's the right amount of discipline that makes you who you are. One of the things I think a lot about and that I dislike, if I was like, describe a philosopher, he'd be like, university professor, turtleneck, like yeah. tweed, you'd think of a weakling. And in the ancient world, like philosophers were people who did shit. They were warriors, they were kings, like Marcus Aurelius Hunts. There's an early Stoic who's a distance runner, one who's a boxer. And what I love when you really read the Stoic text is like, their metaphors are all sport. It's wrestling and fighting yeah. and running and hunting because they did those things. Those things are difficult. Yeah. And difficult things are good for you. And they're good for your mind. Seneca says, we treat the body rigorously so that it will not be disobedient to the mind. Ooh. I like that. That's good. And I think about that when I'm jumping in the shower, jumping in a cold pool, whether I'm pushing myself while I'm running or lifting weights is like... I'm reminding the body who's in charge. That's what the physical practice is. It's the mind asserting itself over the body. We tend to think of philosophers as these sort of soft people, but actually the, the mental practice, the mental resilience, being in charge of yourself is the ultimate muscle that you want to cultivate. And it's the thing that every great athlete has to have. It's good that you have really high standards, but you have to understand it's called self discipline for a reason, meaning it's about you. You don't get to enforce that on other people. This is why Marcus Aurelius talks about being strict with yourself, tolerant with others. Cato says, I can forgive anyone's errors but my own, meaning you leave other people to their own mistakes, you're tolerant, you're forgiving, you understand all the context which just goes into it, and that's why you're not hard on them, but yourself, that's who you don't accept excuses to, that's who you hold to increasingly high standards, because that's the only thing you control. You control self-discipline Discipline, where you're going to go crazy, where you're going to become an asshole, is if you try to enforce those standards, that self-discipline on the other people around you, who, by the way, never asked you to do that. They never signed up for it. And maybe they don't even agree with your standards, even if they could reach them. But the point is really high standards for yourself, tolerant, forgiving, understanding, helpful to everyone else. That's what stoicism is. Joy or happiness or, or, or delight, that's not an emotion we associate with the Stoics. But the Stoics experience that. Epictetus says, me, I delight in my own improvement day to day. His delight wasn't coming uh, from money or fame or recognition or pleasure. It was from getting better every day. It was from improving. It wasn't based on externals, as the Stoics warn us against. It was based on the inner work he could do on himself. It was knowing that he was becoming a little bit better, a little bit wiser, a little bit more self-controlled, self-contained, a little more resilient. That's where the Stoic finds joy and happiness and pleasure. That, I mean, bring it home, Ryan Holiday, right? <laughs> he brings it home in that clip, doesn't he? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I mean, strict with yourself, tolerant with others. Um, mm. The way I related to that, Mark, was something that required enormous discipline and was very hard was running my first marathon this year. And it instantly reminded me of the feeling I had when I had finished. It was like I was done, <laughs> really <laughs> done. But it was as equally this, like a deep peacefulness and satisfaction that I trained for three months for my first marathon. I got it done and I was so calm, so mm. peaceful. It was remarkable. And I think... That really deep, deep satisfaction, that knowingness. I didn't need to explain it. I didn't need uh, the roar of the crowd. I didn't need anything on the day. I just, I had put in so much work and it was so hard and I got it done that it just felt 
good. And mm. that's the joy that he's talking about. That's on the other side of the discipline. Stick with it and good things happen. 1% better every day. How compelling are these truths? I mean, it's ain't sexy and it ain't easy, but Mark, it's sort of essential, isn't it? It, it is essential, you know, and I think the key thing that's standing out to me as Ron Holiday was bringing it home in that clip is the fact that your mind is, is something you can control. You know, if you find yourself getting distracted or uh, not wanting to get out of bed or maybe just ignoring something that's on your to-do list because it's uncomfortable, maybe it's a difficult conversation, maybe it's asking for help. By e- exposing yourself to those difficult moments, building up that muscle, you can then be that uh, version of yourself that's maybe a little bit stronger, maybe it's 1% better the, the next day, like James Clear was saying. It's just finding the, um, I think Ron Holiday puts it really nicely there, the delight in daily improvement is such a wonderful uh, challenge. And, you know, it's really talking to that growth mindset that we've spoken about on the show. I mean, Mike, it is, it's really an encompass, <laughs> uh, it, it's, he's really encompassing a lot of the things that we've learned on the Moonshot Show in this book. It's true. And um, the last secret I want to kind of reveal about this is that if you are super disciplined and go for 1% better every day, you'll, over time, you'll achieve a result. And here's the big cheat. Once you have proof, once you have the evidence that sticking with something on a daily basis and going for small micro improvements, incremental improvements, like sometimes it can be a matter of millimeters between day and, mm. and, and the following day. Once you have had a confirming, a reaffirming experience where you're like, oh, damn, this compounding really works. What happens is it becomes much easier to be disciplined and to have really positive daily habits Mm. because you're like, "Uh uh-huh, I get it now. I know that this will result. I'm not guessing it will result in something. I've had the evidence myself. So what, there's still a little bit of grind to self-discipline, but when you know there is a result at the end, when you know that your run today will contribute to the marathon next month, next year, wherever it is, running today doesn't become so hard because there's a knowingness, you know, I know I'm doing it. So you get this almost satisfaction of finishing the big race, even in the training, because you kind of know that you're directly contribute contributing. And that is all about purpose. When you know the things you do today are contributing to a destiny of tomorrow, a destination in the future, it becomes a lot easier to get it done today. I think the reason so many of us have not truly mastered this is we never got the first win. Yeah. And if I look at my first 20 years, I never really got the big win from discipline. So I was lazy. Mm. I did just enough just to stay out of some trouble. (laughs) (laughs) The point here is that it just gets better and better because you you can take great joy in the daily improvement, even if it's really small, because you just Mm. know it's going to compound like crazy over time. How powerful is that? Yeah. Well said, Mike. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think you're talking exactly where the key lesson from discipline is destiny is really dragging us towards. And I think for one, it's been a wonderful experience digging into this brand new book by Ron Holiday, right? It's been great. And so I guess um, we talked about some big uh aha kind of ideas and insights. We talked about some practical habits what changes as a result of show 206, Mark? Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's a tricky one because there's so much that really does speak to me as I'm thinking about this idea of, of discipline. For me, though, it's this idea about trusting the idea of discipline mm. and the fact that it's not a punishment. Discipline doesn't have to be boring or restrictive. If anything, the discipline to you know say no and to prioritize is very freeing. And I, I love that almost juxtaposition that perhaps a lot of us 
don't necessarily appreciate until we start putting it into action. So I think for me, the idea of trusting discipline, going along with it, testing it and seeing how it does actually benefit you is a big practical takeaway that I can put into action right now by even just leaving my phone out of the bedroom. Oh well, yeah. It, it, and it, and it starts with one thing and it gets like addictive because then you're like, like get to bed early, no, no phone in the, in the room, Not cold, bad. cold shower. Don't check my email. Right. Mm. And you do these things over time and there's, ah, as, as he said, Ryan Holiday, there is joy at the end of this. There is fulfillment and satisfaction. I think that's, that's what we're, we're all looking for. Uh, that's what we're all hoping to find. The, you know, the catch here is though, it's not instant gratification, is it, Mark? No, it takes time. Much like any habit, much like any behavior, mm. it can take time. But, you know, is that enough to put me off? I, I think I'm, uh, I've delved enough into uh, so many individuals on the Moonshot Show, Mike, as has our listeners, that I think the idea of it being, you know, too long term, I think we can just dig in deep, can't we? Discomfort? Good. Good. You got a bit of yucko willing there. Well, <laughs> I mean, look, the evidence is there. Ancient Stoics, emperors, Einstein, Michael Jordan, what did they do? They were disciplined. And that, Mark, Brings us to the end of show 206 with Ryan Holiday. Des- Discipline is destiny. Um, and what a story for our listeners and our members, which began with the power of self control. And that whole thing kicks off with setting your goals and setting your habits. So we know what discipline means and you need to focus on yourself, not on the noise around you, focus on what you want, not what others want of you. And that might very well get a get, get a turbo boost, one might say, by having a great morning routine that does not include your phone. And so when you're there in bed questioning everything, ask yourself, do you want to feel nice versus fulfilled? Because that's the ancient question that lays inside of stoicism. That's what lays at the heart of being disciplined and fulfilling your destiny. And if you are strict with yourself and tolerant with others, you'll go out and find a world of opportunity is around you. There is abundance there for the taking. It is those that are disciplined will truly achieve that destiny. And that is exactly our purpose here together on the Moonshots podcast. It's all about learning out loud so we can achieve those destinies indeed. All right, that's a wrap.